This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by World Anvil. This powerful web-based RPG campaign manager is perfect for building, organizing, and creating your worlds. You can use it to plan your games, create maps and handouts, and keep all of your notes at your fingertips during play, or even share them online with your group. They're constantly innovating with new features such as integrated character sheets for many major RPG systems, so you can manage your world and the characters in it. A basic account at World Anvil is completely free, letting you get a feeling for all the amazing features on the platform. Follow the links in the description below or go to worldanvil.com to try it out for free today. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we are taking our first look at the brand new expansion book for Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. We have both editions of the book with the standard cover by Magali Villeneuve and the special edition cover by Wiley Beckert. Regardless of which cover you pick up, the content in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is the same. You can pick up the standard edition cover uh, uh, through the affiliate links to Amazon in the description below, and you can also pick up the special edition cover at your favorite local game store. The book is also available in digital format on D&D Beyond as well. Today we're going to go over what this book contains, as well as our favorite features, what we think changes the game, and what we think missed the mark a little. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. So cracking the book open, this is a brand new expansion to Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, including a ton of new features for players and player characters, as well as a section for DMs. There are four main chapters to the book. The first chapter of the book covers a slew of player character options for every class in Dungeons and Dragons. The second chapter covers the new system for group patrons. The third chapter features magical miscellany, including magic items and spells. And the fourth chapter includes a Dungeon Master's toolbox, as well as some new puzzles. This is not an adventure. This is a new rules supplement that you can use in any game of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, regardless of the adventure that you're running or the setting that you are using. Many of the contents of this book have appeared previously for playtesting in Unearthed Arcana, but have now been published in their final form in this book. So let's get into it. Let's look at a broader view of what you're going to find if you pick up Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. The majority of this book is made up of the player's section, which kicks things off with a look at player origins. This section of the book introduces new optional rules for character origins and race, allowing you a lot of customization and nuance to the character creation process. There's been a lot of talk about these new rules that allow you to change the ability score bonuses and proficiencies granted by your player character's race. The main idea here is acknowledging the truth that the player characters are the protagonists in a fantasy story. And just as often as protagonists lean into and are defined by fantasy archetypes, just as often player characters and protagonists buck those trends and define a new path and are the exception to the rule rather than following the, the norms. This does allow you to do things like give your halfling a plus two bonus to its strength score or give your orc a bonus to its intelligence score, allowing you to really fully visualize what you have in mind for your character's concept, really unshackling the rules of player character race and the options that those present. The section also presents rules for a completely customized origin, a set of variant rules that might unseat the variant human's supremacy as a great default for any Dungeons and Dragons character. With additional rules to customize what languages and skill proficiencies you have, this broadens the horizons on both character optimization and role-playing aspects of Dungeons and Dragons. Beyond these new options for player character races, there's a lot for player character classes as well. The Artificer class originally introduced in Eberron, Rising from the Last War, has been reprinted in this book in full. It is pretty much the same as the way it was printed in the Eberron books. I have to go through it with a fine tooth comb to make absolutely certain of that. It's reprinted the original three subclasses that in were introduced with the Artificer, and there's one new one as well, the Armorer. 
Aside from the Artificer, every class in Dungeons & Dragons receives new subclasses as well, with the Cleric and the Druid receiving three, where everybody else receives two. Still, this is a large selection of new options for player characters. A handful of these subclasses have been reprinted from other books, such as the Mythic Odysseys of Theros and the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica books, as well as the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. We see the Bladesinger Wizard, the Oath of Glory Paladin, the Eloquence Bard, the Spores Druid, as well as the Order Domain Cleric reappear in this book. Combined with the Artificer, it means that all those player character options, which were scattered across four or five different books, are now all together in one place. So you don't need to buy all those books to get all the juicy new subclasses and new options for your characters. The book also includes a lot of extra options for fighting styles, battle master maneuvers, sorcerer metamagics, and eldritch invocations as well. In addition, each class is presented with a small smattering of new class features. These are class features that either augment an existing class feature, basically being a straight upgrade for anyone playing that class, or allows you a new way to retrain class features already granted, such as giving you the ability to swap out your cantrip choices as you level up your character. Finally, some of these new class features, particularly the ones for the Ranger, require you to swap out an existing class feature and take this one instead. In particular, in the case of the Ranger, there are new options that replace the base options given to the Beastmaster Ranger, and I think might constitute a very significant upgrade for the Ranger. It's kind of their way of sneaking in the revised Ranger without actually revising the Ranger. The book also includes 15 brand new feats for you to select, as well as 21 new spells. However, keep in mind that four of those are cantrips that are reprinted from other source books. The feats are not locked in with many prerequisites at all. In fact, most of the feats have no prerequisites and can be taken by any character, and many of them, in fact, also include a plus one ability score boost to one of several different ability scores. Most of the spells in this book that aren't reprints are summoning spells, but there's a few new gems. And in addition, every class that casts spells has had Wizard of the Coast go back in and add existing spells that are already in the Player's Handbook or Xanathar's Guide to Everything to those classes. For instance, Bards now get Aid, Prismatic Spray, and Prismatic Wall. Uh, sorcerers get Flaming Sphere now. And a few other classes have had a smattering of spells that it just makes sense for them to actually have these spells. They never got them in the original core rules. So it's a nice little upgrade for those characters. It also introduces 47 new magic items, six of which are artifacts and 11 of which are a new magical tattoo. Most notably of these magic items, there are several that allow spellcasters to improve their spellcasting abilities. Most of the magic items in this book are wondrous items targeted at spellcasters. There's only two new magic weapons. There's no magic armor, no wands, no staffs. It's almost all wondrous items aside from two new magic weapons. So that does it for the new player options. If we move on to the DM side of things, we kick things off with a look at group patrons, which was something that was introduced in the Eberron book, but is now made setting neutral in this one. Yeah, there's a few new additions to this, but it's largely the same system that was presented in the Eberron books. Just again here as a cool thing that you can use in your campaigns. Lastly, we come to the section which is a toolkit for Dungeon Masters. More or less, this section is the expansion on the Dungeon Masters Guide, which kicks things off with a much needed look at how to run a Session Zero. Well, I'm really glad to finally see the concept of Session Zero printed in an official Dungeons & Dragons book. I gotta confess, I think our video is still better. Also, if you grab the Essentials Kit, you might be familiar with the sidekick rules that were introduced there. They are expanded upon slightly in this book as well. Furthermore, there's a really cool section on supernatural regions, magical phenomena, and using spells to replicate a natural hazard. I really love the creativity of this section, and this is actually a set of rules that I've kind of been using myself in my own campaigns anyways. And finally, the book ends things off with a section on puzzles for you to use in your game. That's a lot of great stuff overall, but I have to ask the key question, what is the standout stuff for you in this book, Kelly? 
for me going into this book, the thing that I was most excited about and that I actually think paid off more than I anticipated was the first section on character origins. Going into this book, there had been a lot of uh, controversial back and forth about floating ability scores. And so I expected to see a section that says, you have floating ability scores, and that was going to be the end of it. But the way that they presented it in this book, the various options that they give and the reasons for giving them, I think are really strong and not only implement a new way for people to approach creating a character in Dungeons and Dragons, but actually expand on two pillars that aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. If we look at character optimization and role playing, these are the two things that fuel my love for the game. I love creating a character who is defined and will perform well at the table, but also has strong role-playing potential. And with the origin section, I just feel like that is blown wide open and has so many cool tools to really build the fantastical character that you have imagined. I completely agree. I love these rules. They touch on rules that I've used as house rules in our own campaigns before. At the end of the day, these are rules to be used for player characters. They are not rewriting the conception of classic fantasy races and archetypes. They are meant to embrace the idea that player characters are the protagonists in a story and that protagonists in stories, as often as they embody and define archetypes, they often are the ones who buck the trend and are something completely original. These rules make character creation even more nuanced and inclusive. They present more options. In a game where we are always asking for more options, <laughs> it's not a bad thing at all. And speaking of more options, the new options for changing out your class features in small ways is something that I would love to see Wizards of the Coast go even further with. My only criticism of it is that there's not enough of it. I would love to see more alternative class features. I would love to see new takes on existing subclasses. I think that what they did with the Beastmaster Ranger is something that they should go back and do with a bunch of the Sorcerer subclasses as well. I really love it. I love the potential of it. I think it is a standout notion. The amount of new character customization presented in Tasha's is game-changing. It breathes new life into new characters and with such a small and subtle change, it makes character concepts that required house rules so much more possible than ever before. And moving along that line, one of my other favorite things that I'm sure most people are very excited about in this book is the new subclass options. There are some standout examples. I know that both of us have a few favorites. I'm excited to play an armorer, Artificer, and I'm also pretty excited to play a Wildfire Druid. These might not be the strongest subclasses presented, but they are really fun and spoke to me and got me excited to create new characters. I am super excited about some of the strong subclasses in this book, though. The Twilight Domain Cleric looks amazing, and its channel divinity power is absolutely incredible. And the Aberrant Mind and Clockwork Soul Sorcerer in introducing an expanded selection of spells, in basically giving sorcerers of those subclasses 10 new spells known, doubling the number of spells that sorcerers of these subclasses know, really brings a much needed booster shot to the power of the sorcerer. I love what they've done with these subclasses. And honestly, I think that we need to go back on the previous sorcerer subclasses and give them expanded spell lists because the, these subclasses have opened the doors off that. It's amazing. It's great. I love it. Should also do it with the old Sorcerer subclasses. Another standout in this book for me are the new feats. There are some great options here, including ones that allow you to take Sorcerer Metamagics or Eldritch Invocations, as well as great options for weapon combat that include upgrading your abilities with piercing, slashing, or bludgeoning weapons depending on the type of character you're building. I think these are great and really are useful feats that a lot of people will find value in. I think a lot of people as well are going to be excited by the new spells in the book, particularly the new summoning spells. I have to say, these new summoning spells, there's nine of them. It could have been one spell just phrased in a lot of different ways. <laughs> They're basically all the same. They just summon different creature types. 
These are summoning spells that are going to deliver on the fantasy of playing a combat summoner without causing headaches for your dungeon master or game-breaking problems. They're very well-balanced summoning spells. They're excellent. Really glad to have them in the game. There's a couple spells that are duds. There's a couple spells that are reprints. And there's a couple new gems. I really like Mind Sliver and Tasha's Mind Whip. So I'm overall happy with the spell section as well. And when it comes to magic, the magical phenomena and the new magic items are absolute gems. Love them. There's a lot to digest in these sections. They're very expansive, but I think that they're going to bring a lot to many people's games and are well worth a very deep read, cozying up with a coffee or tea and going through them. You'll get inspired for your games by reading the new magic items and spells, I think. So now having waxed rhapsodically about some of the new stuff in the book. It is not without its flaws. Let's talk about the things that we didn't necessarily love about this book. And I'll kick things off by saying that one of my big criticisms about this book is that a large majority, I'm going to say two thirds of this book, could either be summed up by saying that it is reprinted material, could have been covered in an errata, or an uh, article on D&D Beyond could have covered most of this book. Now, there's still the things that stand out in this book that are extremely amazing, but a lot of it is reprinted material or things that we've already seen before that are whole cloth just brought over to this book. Now, I could see the benefit here if you didn't grab the Ravnica book or the Eberron book or some of those other books, then yes, this is your one-stop shop. But if you're an avid book collector who grabs the books as they come out, you're getting a large chunk of material that you already have in your other source books. And there's a few elements of this book that are threadbare and feel like filler. There's this section in this book on Battlemaster builds. I think it's good advice. I just don't think it should have been in this book. There's a section on this book about parlaying with monsters great advice. It is threadbare and it's not enough to fully explain that system. The guidelines for running a session zero are too late. The knowledge on how to run a session zero is well out there and there's one place where the, not, where the information on how to run a session zero needs to be. At the front of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Dungeon Masters and players that need to read advice on how to run a session zero aren't going to find it in the right place. <laughs> Between all that, there's gold. Yeah. But there's a lot of filler in this book. And if you've been following Unearthed Arcana and you've been collecting all the books, there's no surprises here in this book. I mean, there's a few things that have changed since their Unearthed Arcana, which might surprise you, but you're not going to see anything in this book that hasn't been previewed or spoiled in some way, shape, or form already. For example, there's no reason for us to reprint the entire Spore Druid in here just to say that you changed a damage type. That could have been a message delivered to us through an Aretta that just has one yeah. sentence, rather than an entire page of the book dedicated to showing us an already existing subclass just to say we tweaked one thing. And there's a lot of that in this book. I will say, though, that bringing it all together into one book that isn't setting specific does consolidate it, makes it easier to buy. Also, there's a big reason because Adventurers League has the rule that you can only use material from the player's handbook and one other book. So by bringing this all together and making it not setting specific, it also means that all that stuff that was introduced in Eberron and in the other uh, Magic the Gathering books is now available possibly for Adventurers League play. So I think that that's part of the reason why they brought it all together in one place. Even still, I would have liked to have seen even more new things. Yeah, if we if we had had more new things and less reprints, that would have made yeah. me happier. But also, that's coming from me, an avid collector who has every D&D book that's come out for 5th edition. If you're not that person, there's a lot more value. The value goes up the less <laughs> D&D books yeah. you own. Yeah. If you're sitting there with the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Player's Handbook, and this is the third book you're grabbing, good job. You have yeah. most of what you need to play pretty much everything presented in D&D 5e. I think pretty much unequivocally we can say that as of 2020, as of the recent list book, there's two other books that you should buy after the core rule books. This one and Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Yeah. I do want to say there's some ugly stuff in this book. One section in particular that we aren't very fond of. 
Yeah. And that is the puzzle section. The puzzle section in this book is an abject failure at presenting how to run puzzles in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Kelly and I cracked some of these open and I tried running some of these puzzles for Kelly in a simulated way. And the way these puzzles are presented does not adequately manage the flow of information necessary for a player to solve them. Many of the puzzles should have handouts, which don't. Many of the puzzles that do have handouts have handouts that are not that useful. If your group loves puzzles and is good at solving puzzles and you as a dungeon master know how to present puzzles to your group, you will find some fantastic information in these. But if you're grabbing this book 30 minutes before the game session because you wanted to put a puzzle into your game, this is going to be a time bomb that explodes in your face. The hardest part was, as Monty presented me with the puzzles, in almost every case I needed additional information. The puzzles didn't present me with what my actual goal was within the puzzle itself. It showed me the puzzle presented before me and said, now solve it. And I said, what am I doing? The example that I'd like to use is there's a puzzle involving paintings. And I wasn't sure if I was supposed to burn the paintings, look behind the paintings, uh, find magical secrets within the paintings, there wasn't really a clear path that I was supposed to take. I almost grasped what I was trying to accomplish within the puzzle, but without more information and without the DM doing a bit of work in the setting to say, there's this over here, there's this over here, here's the puzzle that's presented and here's what you need to accomplish to solve it, I think most players would be lost. Now, mind you, I'm not necessarily the best at solving puzzles, as we've seen in our live stream, but I still think that even as a DM, if I was running these puzzles, there are tweaks and additional information that I would need to put in front of the players in order to make most of these puzzles make sense at the table. Despite the flaws, the puzzle section, and the large amount of reprints and reworkings that are presented in this book, the real question is, is this book worth it? What do you think? Unequivocally, yes. Especially if you don't have all the other books that have had content pried from them to reprint in here. This book is a must-buy for anyone getting into D&D in 2020 or 2021. If you have just bought The Essentials Kit, Lost Mine of Fandelver, and are looking at buying the core rule books and something else, the question is, this or Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Tough sell. I Right now, they're even in my mind. They are the two most essential, non-core books that you would get. I do think that it's worth it, even if you're an avid book collector of D&D 5e, and even if you've been following Unearthed Arcana, which basically means that 90% of this book is going to be things that you already know are in here. Even then... I still think it's worth it because it is going to be the official delivery of a lot of those concepts. And I think it's well written for the most part in most sections and presented in a really clever way that takes what a lot of people were already doing at their D&D 5e tables in homebrew and rules adjustments and just gives you a set of guidelines to implement them into your game. I think it's an incredibly valuable book. and. It's either tied or better than Xanathar's Guide to Everything for me. However, that I might be saying that because it's my new shiny book and I've had Xanathar's for a while. Yeah. But they're both really essential. I don't think that this book is better than Xanathar's Guide to Everything. I think at best it's a draw. And so your choice is, is really a coin toss of which one you get first. I'm tempted to say if you have to choose between the two, get Xanathar's first. If only because Xanathar's adds a lot more spells. And this has a bit of more of a... Less spells, more subclass features, and everything else like that. If you can get both, get both. If you already have Xanathar's, why don't you already have this book? Go get this book. The links are in the description below. Order it on Amazon or at your favorite local game store on D&D Beyond. It's totally worth it. Get it. Yes, it has flaws. Yes, it has filler. It's still a great book. Don't run the puzzles. See you next time. <laughs> I also just want to say, Tasha's Cauldron is really cool. Tasha's Cauldron of everything, less cool. I wish it had been Tasha's Cauldron of 
something, a word that isn't everything. Tasha's cauldron of customization. Tasha's cauldron of concoctions. Tasha's cauldron of curious concoctions. Tasha's cauldron of magic. Tasha's cauldron of magic would have been a better title. Like, if, he, if for the unoriginal, Tasha's Cauldron of Magic would have just been a better title. Tasha's Cauldron of Creativity. Xanathar's Guide to Everything was funny because the character Xanathar embodied that. Tasha is a master arch wizard who bound grats. She's better than everything. She's awesome. So this has been our look at our first impressions of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Over the next few weeks, we are going to be releasing a number of videos going into more detail on the different sections and options presented in this book. So stay tuned to our channel to make sure that you catch all of the material covering this incredible book. If you've grabbed the book for yourself, tell us what you love about it in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. A big thank you from the bottom of our hearts to all of you out there on Patreon, and especially for those of you who join us for our, our monthly writer's rooms, where you can help us figure out what's good and what's bad in Tasha's Cauldron. If you enjoy the work that we create on YouTube, please consider becoming a patron by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play, Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can find all the previous episodes of those campaigns right up over here. And we've got plenty more videos on player-focused content in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.